Hi, everybody. Uh, so you may not recognize me. My name is Brian. Uh, you know, uh, I, I've been sitting in this conference, but it's good to get up in front of all of you, um, you know, because you haven't seen me before. Um, so hi, I had some technical problems, so now we're kind of showing this on the wiki. And should be even, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, I'm going to talk to you about CSP, which is a technology for helping you to secure websites and get people to secure websites in general. I was going to talk to you about how it could improve the security of your wiki. Um, so CSP is, stands for Content Security Policy. Uh, it's technically an HTTP, uh, HTTP header um, that your server can send to tell the web browser to do things slightly differently in a more secure way by breaking some backwards compatibility with certain older features of the World Wide Web. Um, for MediaWiki, this can help lock it, lock, lock it down so that if a vulnerability is found in something, then, well, maybe the vulnerability can't be exploited. It depends. There's all sorts of vulnerabilities, and this only helps with a certain class of them. But like any dead vulnerability is a good vulnerability. Um, All right. So the question you may be wondering about yourself, it's a wiki, anyone can edit. What is there to secure? But the truth is, not everyone can edit, certainly not in corporate environments. Um, often you have it restricted to different groups of users. Uh, also in corporate environments, you have the unique thing where often the contents of the wiki are sensitive. Maybe not everyone in the world should be able to see them. And like sometimes with this type of security vulnerability, one of the risks are from our public wikis is to use it as part of a vandalism attack. Where for context, basically an XSS vulnerability is when you can put something into a page and then when someone else views it, it takes over their browser and the attacker can control their browser and cause them to do whatever, whether that's visit some page and steal the data or maybe it's to make some edits, maybe it's something else. They basically have control of the browser for that domain. Um, so in a corporate environment, if you have, say, multiple systems on a single domain, maybe an XSS means that someone who has access to the wiki but not the other thing could use it to take over somebody else's browser who's high privileged, who has access to both the wiki and the other secret thing that's more sensitive. Um, Oh, I'm getting used to this mouse. I appreciate everyone bearing with me as like I present badly with technology. Um, so consider the widgets extension. I'm going to pick a little bit on there, but it's a very good example of where you'd want something like this. The widgets extension is an extension that allows administrators to define widgets, which are basically snippets of HTML and work a lot like templates where the user can like put something into the HTML template. So it's seen as a safe way to allow users to do HTML. Um, in this example, I'm going to use the iframe wi widget, which is a widget that allows users to add iframes to the page. But the idea is being that it should be safe, because the user should only be able to add an iframe, not any arbitrary script or HTML. Um, but in this widget example, it has a vulnerability. Uh, the person who wrote the widget originally, which in all fairness, often these are ordinary users and they're not security trained, so we can't blame them, but like they didn't properly escape the source parameter of the iframe. So that means you can put in the source parameter a double quote, and then the web browser will interpret the stuff after that as HTML. So from there you can what's like inject, you can put some content in there that the browser will interpret as JavaScript, even though the person making the widget didn't really want them to be able to add JavaScript. They only wanted to be able to add the iframe. It's kind of, lots of security vulnerabilities could be considered where confusion, basically, where one person thinks the thing is one thing, 
and in real life it's a different thing because the computer always wins in real life in an argument. Um, so yeah, in this example, uh, it wasn't escaped properly and that allows an evil person to inject HTML. So on the next slide. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I was quickly copying and pasting from localhost and it was like all not relevant. Thank you. Um, so, this is the iframe widget. I should almost make the font size bigger, but if you can see that, it has some code there. It, it, so the widgets extension uses the Smarty syntax, which is an older PHP templating language. Personally, it's not my favorite templating language. I think it's kind of easy to shoot yourself in the foot in some parts of it related to escaping, and this is kind of a good example. So in the thing, validate URL, checks that it's an actual URL. But URLs can contain double quotes, but the double quotes delimit the source tag, so you can break out of that source attribute. So in this example, we have this wiki code. As you can see, there's a double quote there. So when it gets substituted, there's source, there's a double quote there, then that's where the double quote ends. It's more obvious if you have syntax highlighting enabled, which I don't. Um, and then after that, that's considered a new attribute on load, which in HTML means run this JavaScript once this iframe loads, and this would pop up an alert box saying all your base are belong to us. At dinner last night, uh, somebody suggested I should make all your base jokes, so I did. Earlier it was much more boring. Um, yeah. Uh, when I was doing it on my laptop, I actually had this queued up in a wiki that had the widgets extension loaded and it all loaded so I could actually show you the box, but I don't think it's worth setting that up on this laptop on the fly. But for example, if you go to MediaWiki widgets.com and put that HTML, I mean, put this wiki code into any page, you'll see the box. Um, let's see. I'm not good at this, the mouse on this laptop. So yeah, this is bad, as I was saying. Uh, maybe they're using this as part of a phishing attack, trying to convince your users to install malware. Maybe this is the first step. Maybe they just want to get the private information of your users, want to know what IP address they're accessing from, want to know what language their browser is, want to track them down. Maybe they want to spy on your users. From here, it's a little tricky, but you can definitely do something where you basically make this more persistent and then log all the keystrokes of that user as they're going around your site and maybe use that to steal the password. There's like a couple other steps to do before that, but it's nothing that complicated. Uh, maybe he just puts it on the main page and has some JavaScript that causes them to load a random page and replace it with poop. That would be like the attack that someone on Wikipedia would do, maybe less likely in a corporate environment, but you know, it would be very disruptive if all your users are editing van graffiti-like edits as fast as they can the moment they load the page. Um, so, CSP, what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, the way it fixes this is two ways. It disables inline JavaScript, so that's all the onload attributes, any sort of inline specified JavaScript so that if somebody finds a way to escape the attribute, they can't do anything because they can only put HTML on the page, they can't put any scripts. And then it adds a whitelist of domains to load like individual JS files. Um, from there, like there's things you can still do but it's very hard to actually turn this into a scripting vulnerability because at most you could tell it to load a JavaScript file from somewhere else but the list of places you could load it from somewhere else are whitelisted to what is hopefully just things you control. Um. Okay, so this 
slide doesn't work anymore because this is now on MediaWiki.org and not my laptop. But previously I was going to show, put it on the page, I was going to previously show what it looks like without CSP enabled where a pop-up box would come up. And now with this enabled, nothing happens. And if you go on the developer console, there would be a little warning about a blocked uh, inline JavaScript. And additionally, it would send off a message back to the API, which would cause MediaWiki, if you have certain debug logging options enabled, to create an entry in a log file saying that it detected this JavaScript. Um, right now, for context, we're currently kind of testing this out on Wikimedia websites. So we have it in something called report only mode, where it sends a little message to the debug log. It puts a little message in the console, but it doesn't actually stop anything. So while we're testing, we're hoping someday soon we'll have it enabled. Um, uh, okay, downsides. Um, the biggest one is a lot of extensions aren't compatible with this. Like for example, page forms, uh, I'm pretty sure would not be compatible with this. Just because they, they use some of these inline JavaScript features, it's a different way to write JavaScript to not use any inline JS. And until recently, there wasn't really a big reason not to. Um, MediaWiki 1.17, at least in core, had kind of a coding convention to avoid inline JavaScript, mostly for stylistic reasons. So a lot of extensions that follow that are compatible, but like a major portion of extensions aren't. Um, we're still like, this is newish, we're still actively working on it. Um, so things are going to change. We're planning to add a better API for extensions to like declare that on this certain page they need to be able to call it to this JavaScript. Like for example, the reCAPTCHA extension might want to specify, okay, on pages with CAPTCHAs you should be able to call it to Google, but on other pages we shouldn't be. Uh, we're also looking into making per user kind of opt-outs, because on Wikipedia there's a lot of gadgets, and sometimes people want gadgets that like combine information from external sources. So we want ind individual users to be able to say, okay, this external source is okay, while still protecting the mass of our users from the privacy implications of having JavaScript just talk to other websites on the internet. Um, yeah, so that's my presentation. Sorry about the technical issues. Uh, questions? I know you, you're probably familiar with the Free Software Foundation and their um, JavaScript, you know, avoid or Libra JavaScript? Libra, yeah, yeah. JS Libra project. And I was just, it just dawned on me. I mean, they would love something like this so that it would load only JavaScript after examining, you know, the license information. So to make sure that it was <laughs> free JavaScript. I, I mean, I think they have an extension that does that. They had at least a They have one that blocks everything that's not. So yeah. I guess they could do the inverse. <laughs> yeah, they had like when it was first announced, my big issue was the way that you associated metadata with the JavaScript files was kind of like a ridiculous method. I don't know if they've improved that. Originally it was something like, okay, you have a comment pointing to an HTML file point that has a table in it with the name of the file and what license it's under. And that was just like a ridiculous way to add licensing information to JavaScript. And I think that really hindered adoption of that. Um, but yeah. This is obviously a very feature very based around this domain is okay, not necessarily this content is okay. Um, and this is a feature built into web browsers, I should be clear. Uh, I believe starting with like Firefox 3.5, um, but there's newer versions of CSP with new features. Uh, there's a lot of them and for different types of sites and whatnot. Cool. Stunned silence. Okay. Thank you. Putting the red button.